This is the American Law Journal. The words spying, torture, and the unitary executive have wended their way into the forefront of the American consciousness. To say that it's created a robust debate would be a gross understatement. But ultimately, it's not about Democrat versus Republican, blue state versus red state. Ultimately, it's about the Constitution. And if we keep the argument there, we might just get through this thing. Good evening. I'm attorney Christopher Naughton. We're here tonight at the Constitution Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I think a very apt site to be holding this conversation tonight. We have four guests on my panel with me this evening, and all of them have an opinion. You'll see how divergent they are in just a moment or two. We want to remind you that if you have questions or comments, you can go to the Law Journal website, lawjournaltv.com. Call us at 1-888-78-LAW-TV, or go to our website and watch any program that we have broadcast over the last 12 months. My guest tonight, Scott Shields, joins us from the law firm of Shields and Hoppy in Media, Pennsylvania, essentially a litigation practice, but with a heavy emphasis on constitutional issues. Gregory McGarrion joins us from Villanova University School of Law, a professor there, a former clerk with Justice John Paul Stevens on the Supreme Court. Jerome Marcus from Berger and Montague in Philadelphia, primarily a litigation practice, former attorney at the State Department. He is a regular contributor to the National Review and the Wall Street Journal and was engaged with the Paula Jones and Bill Clinton matters in the 1990s. Stephen Scheller joins us this evening with Scheller Ludwig and Scheller. Aside from being the lead namesake of that firm, one of the largest personal injury firms on the East Coast, Steve represented the Al Gore team in the butterfly ballot recount in Florida in 2000. Well, let's start the program off with Democratic members of the House Judiciary Committee who met on this NSA spying surveillance issue. And this is Jonathan Turley, who testified against Bill Clinton in the late 1990s. And here he is speaking out against what the administration is doing regarding surveillance. The NSA operation has pushed this country deep into a constitutional crisis and one that there are frankly few parallels in our history. Our system of government rests on a certain axis, a balance of power, of a tripartite system, three branches, none of which have the authority to govern alone. In that system, the very scourge is a maximum leader. It runs against the constitutional grain. It creates a dangerous imbalance. President Bush has, for many years, uh, asserted authority that is both absolute and, in my view, quite dangerous. Now, I want to be absolutely clear. What the president ordered in this case was a crime. It gives me no pleasure to say that. But it also strikes me as an alarming circumstance when the president can go into a press conference and announce that he has violated a federal statute 30 times and promises to continue to do so until <laughs> someone stops him. That statement by Jonathan Turley, is what he's saying a true warning shot? Is there really a constitutional crisis virtually unparalleled in our history? Or is this hyperbole over the top? That is the most overheated foolishness I think I've heard on this topic since the New York Times story began. And the, why is that, true? Well, uh, first of all, the kind of information gathering that the NSA is now engaged in is a kind of information gathering that every single president has consistently done since at least the 1940s. For decades, every international telegram was brought, a copy of it was brought to the White House or to the executive branch every day. All the telegram companies just made a copy and took them there. There was no warrant. During the Clinton administration, the Echelon program, which was publicly known, but totally of no interest to the New York Times or the Washington Post was a regime for the gathering of information on a scale that dwarfs what President uh, Bush is doing with the NSA. Nobody gave a damn. This has nothing to do with constitutional rights and it's all everything about to do with politics. So that's business as usual, Greg? Well, it isn't business as usual at all. I, I think one of the things, and there are a lot of levels to this problem that are worth talking about, one of the things that's very significant about the current situation is that it did involve presidential deviation from and, and flouting of statutory authority. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, that's the FISA Act of 1978. FISA Act passed in response to uh, earlier abuses, and, and, and let's be clear, there absolutely uh, historically have been abuses of uh, surveillance abuses of law enforcement techniques. But you really can't call this is them something. Abuses. This is something that that 
we expect from, this is something that we are concerned about when it comes to government and the executive branch. FISA was meant as a, a safeguard against a particular kind of uh, abuse and attempt by Congress to, in a sense, place a constitutional check on what would otherwise be the unbridled uh, discretion of the executive branch to engage in certain kinds of surveillance. And the Bush administration uh, uh, essentially flouted that. Now, I'm not, I'm certainly not here to defend the Clinton administration, and I'm happy, I guess, if we want to have a discussion about uh, uh, abuses of, of law enforcement authority and excesses, uh, possible uh, incursions on constitutional rights during the Clinton administration. Uh, I'm not a, a big fan of a lot of actions of the Clinton administration, but I'm really concerned with what's going on now. We're in a wartime posture, uh, uh, and we are uh, at a point where there's, there's great concern in administration that's been very hostile to political dissent, very hostile to its political opponents, uh, essentially asking for, claiming, and trying to justify the authority to uh, watch anybody anytime without, uh, without any sort of second guessing. And that's, I, I think there are two points that really need to be made. Wasn't, wasn't that why FISA was created back in 1978, because of the fear of excesses by the executive branch? Well, the fear was that uh, President Nixon was engaged in tapping his enemies. And there was a little bit of political an enemies. political enemies. His, thank you. His, there was a little bit of an allusion to that. There has been no suggestion, none, that the wiretapping that uh, the Bush administration has been engaged in has been abused in that way at all. No we, one we has don't, suggested. You let's, don't know. Let's call it I like don't it know. Is. But there Number has been one, no the suggestion. The main problem no with the Bush administration that it was in that is way. that we don't really trust the Bush administration. To be honest and candid, we've lost faith in it. The world has lost faith in the Bush administration. Well, thanks to we don't, like we you. don't know what like they're tapping, and we don't have any inkling that it serves a legitimate purpose. Nor is there any emergency in the manner in which they're doing it at this point. <laughs> All they need to- You've got to be kidding. We're, we're having a war. We're anybody, having a war. We have and, a president and what who they has need the to do is to do exactly can, what he's doing. Can I finish? And you know, FISA- They start the tapping. They then go to the FISA court and get approval while it's going on. There's no reason to sanctify this misconduct by the Bush administration, which is broad-based. It's well, not think, just I think Steve has said something very important, which, with, with which I entirely agree. There is a legitimate ability to go to a court, have an independent entity look at what they're doing. Let's find out. They don't want to be in the limelight. They don't want to have people focus on their dishonesty, the corruptness, which is okay. rife in this administration. Well, I, I think and it's, uh, what we only are asking for is what's in our hearts. You know, learned hand, we're in the Constitution Center right now, today. In our heart is what, is what this is based on. Is this right? You can't sanctify this. This is wrong. This is not a legitimate debate. This is, in fact, not correct. It's wrong. You know it's wrong. And what has to be done here is very simple. Let the courts take a look at what they're doing every so often. If they claim there's some emergency, the next day, the next couple of days, bring to the court's attention and the judiciary, here's the taps we're doing. These are the people we're tapping. Jerome, what's wrong with What's wrong with that? First of all, what's there, the problem there are with two huge problems. We're, okay, go ahead. First of all, I think Steve said something very important with which I entirely agree. What drives his conclusion is that he doesn't trust George Bush, which is why what I said at the beginning is true. This is all about politics. If there were a better man in the White House, well, Steve Schiller's constitutional that, argument would evaporate. Do you think that people can, mis can mistrust an individual based on real grounds or based on solid grounds? I think the problem that the, that, that the Steve Schellers of the world have is that the office of the president is an office of public trust. It just is. Right. Once the guy, excuse me, once the guy is in there, we have given him a degree of trust, and the only thing you can do is impeach him or wait till the next election. Or and follow Steve, the law. Excuse me. What Steve follow is, the, the law. The question is what the do law. Do what the law says. The question well, is you know, what the law requires. Do what common sense your question dictates. Was, your question was what Go difference does it make? Third, I'll tell you what difference it makes. I'll tell you what difference it makes. I want to see what he's doing. Judge is one of the top. Judge, Judge Kohler, Kelly. Thanks, Greg, for playing my role, but I understand that. I want to hear from you, Jerome. Fine. What's the problem with the FISA court? Here's the problem and Here's getting warrants problem. and applying before the FISA court. Because again, I, I know that the news media has covered some of this, but the administration can go back after they've done the wiretaps, sure. I think 72 hours, right? Mm -hmm. right. They can do it retroactively. Retro yes, they can. Why can't they? Why, not? why don't they? Judge Kohler Kettley, the head of the, uh, of the special court, has issued an edict out of her own authority that says, there's a certain category of information that I refuse to hear. 
in support of warrants. What is it? Well, if you got any information without a warrant, maybe somebody from the 82nd Airborne dragged somebody out of a hole in Pakistan without a warrant and got information from him, and that information was used in support of a warrant, Judge Kohler Kettley doesn't want to hear about that. The president has the authority, the inherent authority, subject to nothing that Congress can say to repel an attack. But Jerome, and what that means, well, it, it, what that means is that if what he's doing is trying to repel the next World Trade Center, and that's his judgment, then he has the inherent authority to do it irrespective of any statutory no regime. Review, let me, let me respond to that. that. That that's an extravagant and and really dangerous conception of inherent presidential authority because your your notion of of what constitutes action taken to repel an attack is essentially unlimited. And look, this isn't about not trusting George Bush. I'm willing to I'm willing to stipulate to that. This has nothing to do fundamentally with this president of this administration. This has to do with the flip side of something you said about the presidency. Yes, the presidency is an office of public trust, but it is also ingrained in our constitutional system that we do not simply trust our governmental officials. We do not simply give them carte blanche to you. do what they will, particularly, we particularly the executive, because the executive, especially based on trends over the past 60 years, is the most powerful official in government in ways yes, that the, the framers probably hope to avoid. But there's one exception to that. There's one exception to that. But and in the conduct of a war, the laws fall silent, the Supreme Court falls silent. When President Lincoln wants to suspend habeas, no sitting court, while it's happening, is going to do anything about it. When President Roosevelt wants to round up every Japanese person on the West Coast and put them in but concentration Jerome, camps, Jerome, 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 that's Jerome, what Jerome, happened. Listen, listen to yourself. You are defending some of the most ignominious episodes in American history. They may be ignominious, your argument, but they are your, not unconstitutional. Your argument is on its face a defense of autocracy, a defense of a slide into well, fascism, and we cannot allow Steve, that. Steve, Steve that, that brought it up. He more said, overheated he said it rhetoric. For you guys, it comes from I'm the sorry, heart. your rhetoric is overheated well, rhetoric. You're talking it, about an absolute Judge presidential power in time of war. quote Steve, is on Steve, the wall. Steve, Steve. The president is the ultimate authority on all matters uh, concerning uh, foreign affairs. He's also the commander in chief. He has this inherent authority. Actually, the Constitution inherent authority. doesn't say that no, at all. The Constitution gets Congress power over foreign affairs. You're talking about the text the of the Constitution. Pre FISA, post FISA, they've all confirmed that Congress does not have the ability or the authority to usurp uh, uh, the president's Humvee versus, powers. Humvee versus Rumsfeld. I mean, th this is not. Oh, yeah, that's a great decision, Humvee well, versus Rumsfeld. You're simply making that, 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 that is in not. In the Humvee case, Sandra Day O'Connor says that even in time of war doesn't give the president a blank check. But what the question is, a blank check to do what? There's no judicial review. If the president wants to send this battalion to that battlefield, nobody can go to court. Now, and I don't think this side of the aisle has any problem with that. Oh, I think they would. I think there are plenty of people. Why don't every you time ask there's us. a war, every right. time. Why don't you ask us if we well, have a problem with battlefield decisions, Jerome? Rather well, than putting Mr. Words Scheller, in on Mr. Scheller wait, has wait, said wait, wait, wait. that he doesn't want there to be any kind of decision that's not subject to judicial review. Well, if I may, this this current episode isn't, thankfully, a matter of purely partisan animosity. Uh, Senator Specter, Senator Graham have raised questions about what the president has done here. This is not just a bunch of woolly-headed liberals yelling at a president they don't like. This is a, a, a group oh, of no. people, perhaps right, perhaps wrong, but people who are concerned about the potential for erosion of constitutional rights and the undue expansion well, of presidential power, raising principled yeah. objections to a, a, a serious... I, I guess uh, I would have program. a much easier time believing that they were principled objections if the same people yeah. had made the same arguments when they applied with the same force to Democrats. Why does and they this, didn't. Why does this have to be a sniping match. I'm, I'm sitting here. We're talking here. We're people of well, good faith. We're decision. talking about the current situation, and I, I hope that you're willing to presume good yes, faith. Yes, I'm on willing. My part I, have no, I have no problem presuming so your good faith. So we're making principled arguments. I'm interested in knowing why they might be wrong. Fine. That's what we do. But that's but fine. Here we are in the Constitution Center with the Hamdi decision. Justice Thomas, in his dissent, uh, quoted Alexander Hamilton in Federalist Number 70 and 74, and talked about the need for a unitary executive which is what we have and what we need because there's a constitutional basis for it, which is why our president is allowed to engage in these warrantless types of eavesdropping. We're not talking about a situation where he's eavesdropping on our wives or our girlfriends wow. swapping sweet potato pie recipes. We're talking about a very, very real threat, an enemy that wants to kill us, and they're everywhere. What is that got to do with going to the court after the fact? FISA with, really and, only applies within, to criminal actions. Within 72 hours, Congress within a week. Don't say it only applies powers. to criminal actions. Read the act. I read the act. 
The position is common sense. It's based in the Constitution. It's, not it's based, based on the in one's heart. It's based in common based sense. In you're, 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 what is wrong with doing the right thing? The question he is, is what the is right the right thing? thing. You, the right thing whatever is, he right wants. Let's, let's, let's try right this on for right size. You're making, you're making arguments about <laughs> the, the extensive nature of the commander in chief power, of the executive power, that were expressly rejected by the Supreme Court in the steel seizure case during the Truman no, administration. At a time, at a time, at a time when we were at war, when we faced a much more serious threat to this country's security, a nuclear threat of great magnitude than we face today. You've made the point that we're at war and that this is this is cause for great concern. But you have to understand, I think you do understand, we all understand, that the greatest test of our constitutional structure, the greatest test of our constitutional commitment to civil liberties comes in war. Time. The stakes yes, are yes. not high in peacetime. I mean, if the Clinton administration, no, if, if the, the Clinton administration are, are committed great peacetime. sins, if the Clinton administration committed great sins against civil liberties, and you know maybe so, but didn't really get to uh, get to take it to the stage because the president didn't have occasion to assert the kind of monumental authority that comes with wartime. This is when the Constitution gets a gut check. Well, your assessment of the need for this rests on a judgment which you just articulated in passing very quickly. Uh, that, well, you know, the harm that we face now really isn't all that great. And I, I find that stunning. Let, let me first be clear. Of all, first, I, of all, first of all, it's inaccurate. I didn't say we face a harm that's not that great. I you said, said it was not anywhere near as great a, as the I, nuclear harm. I said we harm. face a, a, a danger that is less great than the nuclear threat from the Soviet bloc in the 1950s. Okay, well, do you disagree? Absolutely. You, you, you believe that we are in a greater, well, okay, we'll have, yes, to, we'll I have do. to agree to disagree I, historically. I do, I do, My but what, is, I, find, let, let what me, I find surprising is that the president, who was elected, unlike any of us, <laughs> has his own judgment to make about well, that, and, and your view, well, this time, Steve. Uh, well, and, and and inter right. Interestingly, yeah. and, 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 gentlemen, and gentlemen, gentlemen, I'm going to roll in a statement that President Bush uh, made in Buffalo in April of 2004. There are such things as roving wiretaps. Now, by the way, anytime you hear the United States government talking about wiretap, it requires a wiretap requires a court order. Nothing has changed, by the way. When we're talking about chasing down terrorists, we're talking about getting a court order before we do so. It's important for our fellow citizens to understand, when you think Patriot Act, constitutional guarantees are in place when it comes to doing what is necessary to protect our homeland because we value the Constitution. Clearly, at that time, the executive branch was engaged in wiretaps, was engaged with the NSA spying and surveillance, and warrants were nowhere to be found. And no, yet he was, oh, they were not nowhere to be found. They were not found in every single instance. That's the issue here. There's no doubt that warrants are being obtained by the bucketful. The question is, yeah, must right, a warrant so then, be obtained in so, every single instance? Right, when the but, law requires that a warrant well, be obtained. Well, no, when the statute, in your view, requires it, and the Constitution, in my view, does I, are, are you arguing that FISA is unconstitutional? I'm just curious, because that's an argument that's been I, made. I am arguing that insofar as it purports to restrict the president's inherent authority to do this. Well, when doesn't it, Jerome? See, that's the words, argument that was rejected Why would they get warrants at all? No, if the president no, had unbridled no, power, what Justice Jackson Jerome, said in this, if, if the president had unbridled power, why would he need to get even those five or six or ten warrants that apparently uh, he was alluding to in his uh, April 2004 speech? It's not five speech. or six or ten. Well, let's say it's a thousand. Well, it's why a lot. Was it? But I think the question... Why was he even going to get those warrants then? I, well, I think there are many reasons why... I think the question is not why was he getting the warrants when he was getting the warrants. The question, and it's a hard question, and Steve has asked this question and the administration has not answered it. The question is, at least not as well as they could, the question is, why are you not getting the warrants when you're not getting the warrants? And I don't know the answer to that question. I think there are times when things like this should not be revealed. I don't think there's anything wrong with the president saying what he said while he was doing what he was and doing. Do, do you really think add. that the need, the need to, to uh, try to convince Al Qaeda terrorists that their phones aren't being tapped at a time of great conflict is a good justification for lying to the American people? Because that seems He's implausible to me. To if I'm oh, Al Qaeda, if I'm Al Qaeda, I'm not talking on the phone thinking oh, that I'm I, just... I, first of all, you're wrong. They did talk on the phone, and there were times, there was a time shortly after, shortly after September 11th when the fact that certain phone numbers had been accessed was blabbed by some senator, and the next day, the guy changed his phone number. Shortly after September put it this 11th. Way, there was a time before September 11th when they had all the information necessary to take steps to deal with Al Qaeda, and they didn't. Yeah, this yes. is a very well, important point. And they had the warrants at that time. This is no, a very and they got the warrants. Oh, I believe you are incorrect. Well, I believe I you will discover that they did have the warrants. They did have the information. 
but the FBI, the administration, and all those responsible didn't take appropriate yes, steps. Yes, including yes, President Clinton, that. who was offered the opportunity to have uh, Osama bin Laden delivered to him and refused it. Can well, we talk that's about that's that's we talk about an if, if you look in the de definition section of FISA for electronic surveillance, it, it requires a warrant for law enforcement purposes when you're going to eavesdrop on an American citizen that does not have an expectation of privacy. So clearly there is a law enforcement undertone to getting a warrant requirement, which is really based on probable no, I'd like cause. To, I'd like, to, I'd like, to, I'd like if I could. I'd like well, if I could. there's an argument to be made, but, but when you're talking about presidential powers under Article Two, and we're dealing with Al Qaeda, we're at war. There is no need yeah, I, I under think the unitary this is a very theory of theme. the executive branch to obtain well, under a the warrant. unitary theory, which is not a that majority, not a, not a, not a well, that comes from our founding theory. fathers, believe it or not. So it comes from your very controversial conception of what our founding fathers said. Oh, that's said what they the said. So, so it is well, well, and then as soon as and as soon as the, the language Supreme doesn't Court help you, you start talking about war. interpretations after the fact, which is the the slippery right. refuge of the well, of the that constitution that the of, the, of the constitutional fundamentalist document that we're arguing about now. A lot of understandings went into the formation of the document we're talking about. Many of which you seem to have no interest in, such as the role of the legislature. And making the and law the, and the role of rights and, and the protecting role of people. separation and of power. And the role of the, the legislature king, can encroach on presidential the role of authority. The king and and taking, the president can encroach on legislative yeah. authority. It's yeah. called separation of powers, yeah. checks and balances, yeah. not the president's constitution and his supporting Th That's well, why we're, we're sitting here in this constitution here the center today. It's because of the concern the for the king engaged in excessive misconduct and treatment of the of the colonies. That's what we're here about. That's why this center was built. You're going back to, can to the king. And I'm telling you, what you were doing and sanctifying is misleading the public, is misleading the audience listening to this. It is wrong. It is not in our I Constitution. And it is let's not see, something you should be sitting here supporting. And it's about time that we as lawyers, Jerome, do you, you know, we're all lawyers. Point in time it's where time the we president can have too much power. At a time of war when he's playing role as commander in chief, he is all powerful. I he think basically there is, trumps I think there is, the other branches of government I think in is, virtually any scenario. I think there is a real problem with uh, a president doing things to American citizens on American soil and to the, that are not involved in interactions with people from outside the United States. All right, here's my problem with, with, with the line you're taking here. Const serious concern for constitutional rights demands us to conjure up scenarios where the guys in ah, power and, do and, bad things. You know, I, Professor, you've done something extremely important here. Extremely important. We are all lawyers. None of us is a soldier. None of us is the commander in chief. And we all think about this problem as a legal problem, as a law enforcement problem. This is not a law enforcement so, problem. So Osama bin Laden and the terrorists that he is working with and the acts that they want to commit on the soil of the United States wait, are not wait, a wait, criminal Jerome, Jerome, problem. Is this the they old, are a military problem. Is this the old, if you question the president, you're supporting the terrorist no, argument? Because no, that's I'm just tell, no, 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 disgraceful. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is ridiculous. You made the comment earlier on. The the on. You said that people regime. don't trust the president because of what people like Steve are saying. Yeah. You're casting aspersions on people who dare to question the authority of the president. Well, and what you're telling me isn't just that we differ. What you're telling me is that arguments are not worth having with people who disagree with you. It's, 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 a, well, it's a fanatical we have, position. We just it's it's exactly the kind of position that leads to the sort of document. authoritarian tyranny that we're expressing concern about. Could I suggest the concept that, that might be worth adding about. to this conversation? Ahead, it was suggested a minute ago that at this moment when we're at war is a particularly important time to focus our minds on the potential abuses of power by the government. And I think that's the regime that we all grew up with. We all grew up with Vietnam. We all grew up with President Nixon. We all grew up with that problem and that mindset and we viewed our parents viewed certainly my parents viewed I don't know about your parents but my parents certainly did view the waging of that war as an excess of executive power there was the impoundment problem there were all kinds of constitutional issues that were all wrapped up in that and the question of war making and the question of executive power were the questions of the day and I find it very interesting that at a time when I believe our liberty is very severely threatened by by weapons and by an ideology which I find extraordinarily dangerous, I think it's very interesting that 
Um, your suggestion is that the most pressing problem for us to be analyzing is the legal question of the scope of the president's power. I think the most pressing problem for us to be focused on, focusing our minds on, and I put it to you that I think most of the country agrees with me, and so I think so does President Bush, or I agree with him. Well, I think the most you. pressing problem is how does the country defend itself so it doesn't get destroyed? So wait, well, I we, can't do, we can't do both at the same time. No, I, no, 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 no. The question is what do the laws really require? in a time of war. To say, oh, well, I can't have the laws and war at the same time, is to assume that the laws really don't let you conduct a war properly. I want to first find some common ground. You said a couple of minutes ago that the question here is, is not a question of, of, it should not be a question of, of concluding uh, axiomatically that the laws do not allow war to happen, that the conduct of war has to be able to happen. I think that's something we can all agree upon. I think you framed the question in the right way. What you just said a moment ago, though, is, disappoints me because it's it, it's kind of mechanistic. You're talking about a politically accountable human being. Okay, let's talk about that. If the president makes decisions in secret without accountability to another governmental decision maker, if that's what's going mm -hmm. on, the president is not in any serious sense politically accountable. Now, there are, some, there are some decisions that cannot be politically accountable decisions. I think this is where we agree. You talked about battlefield decisions, and I'm not sitting here, Jerome, arguing that the president should be second-guessed on that's battlefield decisions. That's what we're decisions. talking about. This that's is not, the battlefield. I'm, I'm talking, we're on the Jerome, battlefield. Jerome, the problem with that argument is it goes you very could, far. the president could characterize the war so expansively as to yes. dwarf any You're opposition. Right. As to, could, and, and, and that's, that that's why it's important for lawyers to have these arguments. You belittle no. that notion. But it's important no. that the president not be alone in in, in making determinations alone. about where the, yeah. the president must be alone in determining the boundaries of the conduct of war, of the then war. if the president determines that the conduct of war requires, for example, surveillance of domestic political opponents whose opposition to the war might harm the war effort in some indirect way, then the president must be left alone to make that decision. Until he's turned that out can't, or impeached. That can't be right. I don't that agree with you. That can't be an accurate description. I don't description. agree with you, and I think the problem okay, is Okay, well, not, that's, that's really where okay, we're different. The problem is not that that would, I'm not saying that would be good. I know I, you're not. Okay. I'm not saying you would. The question would, I'm not is not, is it good? The question is, can you construct a regime under which a court would have the ability to stop that bad thing without also necessarily asserting the power to stop something else which is not bad I, or which the court is not in a position to assess. And I'm saying that we got slippery slopes in both directions. You're right, there's a danger that the court could, could, could usurp presidential authority. There's a danger the president could go too far. And the whole point of our constitutional balance, and this gets point, back to the point Steve was making a moment ago, is to find a, a, a balance of powers, an equipoise of authority but the idea of that prevents a court the danger. Over the exercise of these wartime issues when they're happening, I find terrifying. Hey, folks, that's all the time we have for this discussion tonight. I hope we'll have many more of them in this year of 2006. I think it's a pivotal year, it's an important year to have these kind of discussions. I want to thank uh, the group who gathered here on the set tonight. See, no blows, no fisticuffs, that sort of thing. Scott Shields from Shields and Hoppy, Jerome Marcus uh, with Berger and Montague, Steve Scheller with Scheller, Ludwig and Scheller, and Professor Greg McGarrian at uh, Villanova University School of Law. Gentlemen, thanks a lot for this conversation tonight. Thank, thank you, you thank to you. all of you watching tonight. Again, we recommend go to our website, lawjournaltv.com, this program, will be up on the webcast tomorrow. You can uh, check it out. If you need uh, the name of an attorney in three dozen different areas of practice, you want to find out what's coming up next on the show, go to lawjournaltv.com, get your law on demand. I'm Christopher Norton. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week right here. Good night now. Tonight's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Scheller, Ludwig, and Scheller one of the largest personal injury firms on the East Coast, winning large verdicts for their clients injured by Vioxx and other dangerous medicine, defective medical devices, consumer protection class action lawsuits, and product liability. Scheller, Ludwig, and Scheller. 800-883-2299 and at Scheller.com.